Uh, hi, everyone. So this is, uh, I, I want to start talking about Friedrich Nietzsche today, uh, the introductory lecture. Uh, I've asked you to read some selections from Beyond Good and Evil. Uh, we're going to get to those uh, a little bit later, but I'm going to lay some groundwork for the man uh, and his ideas now. Because um, there's really no getting Nietzsche from a couple of passages. Um, Nietzsche is too big for quotes. Um, but that's what we're left with to try to understand Nietzsche unless we do everything, which would be great. But we're not doing that. Um, so we're going to do Nietzsche, whatever his dates, 1844, 1900. Uh, 1900 was a nice little pivot point to sort of end a modern period, certainly as regards philosophy and culture, and begin something like a postmodern period. Uh, certainly in Europe, he's a, a German Prussian. Um, so he's European, and uh, the philosophy that is uh, comes after Nietzsche, or at least somewhat after Nietzsche, is called postmodern philosophy. So uh, Nietzsche inaugurates a new sort of thinking, well, not with him only, but, you know, we can kind of point at him. Um, so uh, an important figure, a pivotal pivotal figure, I say a couple things about Nietzsche. First of all, if you read Nietzsche and you're not offended, read harder. I mean by that, pay more attention because he's going to take every value, everything that is sacred and true and good and right, from God to science to mathematics to uh, self to whatever, 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 and he's going to throw it under the bus, right? So I am sure that you are committed to something that he is going to ridicule. Uh, ridicule, I'm, I guess, may, might be the right word. Um, he, he's certainly going to show it's untenable or no, no longer worthy to attach oneself to or something like this, right? So all these values, all of these, ascent, all of the, the ways that we orient our lives, religious values, secular values, everything, you know, humanity, God, faith, reason, whatever you might commit yourself to, he's just going to throw them under the bus. So, uh, be ready to be offended. Um, but be, by throwing these values that we live by under the bus, it, this is what I'm saying, saying you know, by, by sort of raising them to the ground, by problematizing them, by showing that they are like sort of um, limitations on ourselves and actually powers of like the tranquility or, or, or like sort of control by showing all that these values that we've committed ourselves are no longer their pure, their purity that we had given them, uh, now though that makes him the liberator, the great liberator, right? He's just the great liberator in the sense that he he's going to take all of these things that we live by and just get you know, see ya. Why is that a liberation to a terror? You know, some people be like, yeah, all right, that's cool, man. Uh, I'm all for that then you don't understand Nietzsche enough because that means that your life becomes something that you have to live on purpose, right? Everything that you committed yourself to, to today now becomes something that, you know, you've lined up your life according to values that have just been there to line your life up according to, right? You know, you got these things going on, you're just doing this because it's what you're supposed to do, right? And he's going to say, that to you. He's going to show you that you've given yourself to a life that's not yours. So now, if you continue down that path, you either do so like by way of a self-denial, or you do so on purpose, or you choose another path. Right? You can still walk the same path, but it's a different way. Because now, now you're choosing it. I'm, I'm doing this on purpose, even though I was doing it before and I didn't know it. I mean, either way, I gotta. I, my life becomes my own. Am I doing the right thing? Is this the right way to do that? Whatever. What are the goals I've even set myself towards? Are they worthwhile? You know, all of this becomes something I have to attend to now. And that can be, that can, you know, that's why he's a liberation to a terror. Because that's like, there's, there's no happy answers there. There's nothing that's just so sure of itself. Nietzsche says, Nietzsche's got all of these great sort of uh, uh, 
passages that, that indicate something like this. He says, so um, I, what if we find out that life be tragic? Well, then insipid tragedia, which is the Greek word, the Greek phrase for let the tragedy begin. Right? Uh, he's got these metaphor, uh, these uh, nautical metaphors. Uh, you know, we set sail for new horizons. They may not be bright, but they're our own. Right? So it's like, freedom isn't like knowing everything in advance. That sort of knowing everything in advance is going to be what we're going to call the will to truth. And that sort of kills freedom, kills individual, kills self-expression. Because I've become the same, same, same as everyone. All right, so uh, liberation to a terror. So let me, you know, one might ask, you know, is Nietzsche just a jerk? Because it sounds like he's just, you know, out to go. Uh, you're a dummy, you're a dummy, you're a dummy, and so are you. Well, um, you know, we'll see. I, I don't think he is, but we can we can contemplate that. To get, the, to get like a handle on the man, though, I want to spend a minute, uh, I want to talk about who he is a little bit. There's so much to talk about in his biography that I, I'm, I'm just going to indicate, gesture toward it. You know, there's this most often quoted phrase of his, God is dead, right? I want to try to get a sense of what that means. Um, and then uh, how he might fit into, like, post-modernity, how he is this pivotal thing or whatever like that. Uh, so uh, Nietzsche the man. Now, so let's see. I, I, there's a whole bunch of biographical things that one could indicate. He lived with a bunch of sisters and his mother, so... Was it a thing that he had no other men in his life? Some have said stuff like that. Um, evidently, he was celibate, um, whatever that might mean. But I've also heard that he died of syphilis, so uh, there's some contradictory things there. First off, though, in this time period, like dying of syphilis was a thing that happened to a lot of people. It wasn't so much an indicator of sexual um promiscuity or, or looseness or whatever like that. It's like it wasn't that kind of thing. It was just a, a nasty disease that killed a lot of people. It, the cure was drinking mercury. Uh, so one way or the other, you were going down, I suppose. Um, but contemporary uh, neurologists have looked at Nietzsche's uh, symptoms and, 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 what is, and whatever and said that maybe the diagnosis would better be understood as a brain tumor. So not syphilis. That would that might fit more well with uh, the, the the Nietzsche that, that is celibate story, but either way, he certainly wasn't a you know a sort of womanizer or whatever. You know, it, there's this story about Nietzsche that that he saw this man beating his horse, right? This man beating his own horse, right? And Nietzsche was, ran out so so just like distraught by this, you know, uh, this image, this 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 thing playing out before him, this violence against an animal. And so he's trying to get the guy to stop the guy that doesn't stop beating his horse. So Nietzsche bought the horse from him. You know, how do you get the guy to stop beating his horse? Well, you, you make it your own. Now you can't beat it, right? Does he need a horse? Nietzsche need a horse? No, he just doesn't want it to see it be beaten. So, I mean, this there's this too. You know, who, do, who does that? I mean, you, does he go save a horse and then go around and tell everybody, oh, you're a dummy, you're a dummy, you're a dummy? You know, I don't know. It doesn't seem to be, uh, the, you know, doesn't, there seems to be an inconsistency. Another thing is this. The man wrote, like, lots and lots and lots of pages. Lots of them. Um, one does not spill that much ink just to call people stupid. Right? I mean, he's he's he's... He's not out to just like demean and diminish, I don't think. How I like him, Nietzsche, uh, is I don't even know if this is a real thing that happened, but back in the old the movies and the TV shows from back in the day, after a newborn was uh, just birthed from its mother, the, you'd spank it, right? Evidently it was to make it start breathing or something like that, but you know, it always looked so brutal. Um, but you know, to take your breath. Wake up! So it's not so much, Nietzsche's not so much about 
making fun of, but making you wake up. You know, he's like, he's, he's like, I cannot believe these things that are human give themselves such low measures for greatness. Wake up! So I, this is how I think that we, we should understand Nietzsche. Uh, maybe this is a, a too happy a read of Nietzsche because sometimes there is a more belligerent and kind of mean Nietzsche that is harder to say, oh, he means that in a good way, <laughs> you know? Um, so uh, let's explore some of the, those a little bit more. Um, so Nietzsche the man, uh, so he's, he's been called a misogynist. This is a woman hater, you know, someone who always, uh, women are dumb or stupid or whatever, this kind of thing. Uh, Nietzsche is probably a little bit more sophisticated than that, just easy dismissal. But he does say things like, the, he writes about the eternal boring in woman, or how woman has no command, or no concern, and, and like, no control. No, no taste. <laughs> you know, it's just like, wow, that's, that's, that's not nice. You know, so how do we understand this? Well, you know, and again, in his personal life, you know, was it, was this his mom and sisters or something like that? He was celibate, whatever. But he, he also fought his administration at the university to allow women to attend university. You know, this is, what? You know, so, I mean, what do we understand about Nietzsche? Um, so, I can't say, I can't tell you to just not worry about the misogyny stuff. He doesn't mean it, you know. Uh, but I, I do think that maybe some ways to read Nietzsche makes it a better understanding of that than, than just like this sort of dismissal. Uh, uh, on a related note, you know, the, the sort of, well, growing anti-Semitism in the, uh, the German states and or then Germany uh, and during this, this time. So Nietzsche writes stuff that's anti-Semitic. I mean, you're going to read it. Uh, you'll read some. There's stuff that's, that in our selection, you won't read a whole lot of it, but there's stuff elsewhere. There's, no long, there's not like a whole long diatribe of, you know, 400 pages of how, you know, the uh, Jewish people have made everything horrible. Nothing like that. But the stuff there is, is, well, you know, anti-Semitic. You wouldn't want to read it. It's not happy, right? Uh, hooked noses, stuff in some places, stuff like that. You know, the Jewish people, like, um, they control by argument and law. You know, it is just this kind of same sort of thing. And what, what sense do we make of that? Um... You know, again, it's not something I want to just sort of dismiss and say, oh, don't you worry about it. But, you know, is the anti-Semitic stuff that Nietzsche says is right alongside of everything else that he critiques and everything else that he makes fun of and everything else that he, you know, thinks makes us static. So, I mean, anything else that makes us static, I mean, um, you know, Nietzsche critiques and it hates, one could say, everything. And the Jews are just part of that. So, you know, when we read anti-Semitic stuff after the Holocaust, it shows up as something that, that means really just one thing. And again, I don't want to dismiss it as not dangerous or not worthy of reflection, but, I, you know, Nietzsche is critiquing everyone. So, you know, he's going to say that all of it, all of English, all of English Darwinism has the stink of a small people confined to a small island, right? You know, he's going to make fun of Darwin and, and the English, and then he'll make fun of the Jews, and then he makes fun of women, and then he makes fun of the Christians, then he makes fun of the, then he makes fun of somebody else, and so like everyone is on the chopping block. So one can put more or less emphasis on these sorts of. Uh, critiques and say that Nietzsche hates X people, whoever that might be, women, uh, Jews, uh, Christians, Americans, whatever. But I think that that misses most of what Nietzsche is. And so 
um, I think a more dynamic understanding of, of, of Nietzsche is, is, is helpful. Now, let me add, com make a comparison. Um, I think that there is something like a relationship that can be made between uh, South Park, the contemporary uh, animated program, and Nietzsche. And any episode, just about any episode you watch in, of South Park, the character Cartman uh, says anti-Semitic things, and oftentimes it's more than you really can count. Is the show anti-Semitic? You know, I mean, it's no. I, it seems like it's it, it's just part of the entire critique and and making stupid of a whole lot of ways of thinking. And if we understand Nietzsche like that, I think that we can understand. I. I think that his his misogyny and anti-Semitism is better understood. Okay, again, not to explain it away and say it doesn't mean anything, so don't get worried about it. But uh, it, to put it in context, right? So the last thing you know, and is this nihilism? What is Nietzsche's nihilism? So first of all, what is nihilism? Nihilism, you know, uh, there's like a philosophical sense and a contemporary sense. It seems to me. And if we're talking about the contemporary sense, then Nietzsche is not a nihilist. Philosophically, Nietzsche is not a nihilist. Um, uh, we'll, we'll try to uncover that. Uh, nihilism is the commitment uh, or the understanding that there are no real values in the world, right? So all moral values, all political values, all individual values, all religious values, all value is just made up by humans. And then we pat ourselves on the back and said, oh, that's great. Uh, so equality and, and the divine and the sacred and all of that, I mean, just, it's all just so much words. And that's it. So living according, living to, according to words is, is, well, just silly, right? Now, there's something of Nietzsche there. But... The contemporary nihilism that I hear is then said, therefore, sex, drugs, rock and roll. And so like, that is to say, the life of pleasure. So since there is no value in the world, the life of pleasure is all we're left with. But that ain't Nietzsche, right? Actually, that kind of, that sort of, that's a hedonism. It's called hedonism. This is... Uh, the life of just seeking pleasure, right? The, uh, the, life, the life of seeking uh, <laughs> constant pleasure is a hedonism, right? And so this is like an adolescent, this, this nihilism is like an adolescent freedom. You know, since my mom and dad went away for the weekend, party, right? Since there's no longer something telling me I can't do X, Y, and Z, I'm gonna go do X, Y, and Z. But th that's not Nietzsche and that's not free. And that's not nihilism. That's really, that's using nihilism as a mask for doing what you wanted to do. And doing what you wanted to do is not a valueless thing. Seeking pleasure is a, the assertion of a value. The only thing that's worth damn is pleasure. You know, there's no things that are worth a damn, oh, except for pleasure is worth a damn. You know, that's, that's not a thoroughgoing nihilism. So, you know, that's an adolescent nihilism that wants to have its way because there's no longer an authority telling me I can't. For Nietzsche, that's just like, it's cheap. The fact that there's no longer something telling me how I'm supposed to live doesn't mean that I'm freed from living a certain way. Just because there's no value given in advance Man does this, woman does that, rational things do this, equal people do this, you know, whatever. Uh, th since that's not given in advance, it doesn't mean that I don't make value in my life. In fact, the only value that could ever be found ever anywhere is the value that I live right here, right now. So I am responsible for all value. That nihilism is those who like to party when my, my folks are out of town. That's an adolescent thing. It doesn't want to take responsibility for itself. 
It wants to do what it wants and says and say, it doesn't matter, right? But that's like even lying to oneself. For Nietzsche, I, I am like a work of art, the self, that this guy Nietzsche. I am like a work of art. I am responsible for how it comes out. There's not already a thing in advance. I'm not doing it by number, but I'm creating it myself. So any sort of nihilism that is like masking a hedonism or or, you know, or, or, or any other kind of thing that doesn't take responsibility for itself isn't Nietzsche. And I, you know, I say even philosophically, uh, uh, Nietzsche is not a nihilist. You know, the, in the in the colloquial sense, in the contemporary sense, you know, nihilism is that hedonism. But philosophically, it's something perhaps a little bit more. But even even Nietzsche is not that, because he doesn't want to be. To be a nihilist means that I've sort of staked staken a claim on my my life, and that's the claim I'm sticking to, right? Anything that's an ism ain't Nietzsche. So a nihilism is to say that there is no value in la 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 no matter what comes. And that means that I have shut down future possibilities from ever showing up because I've said only this is what will show up. And so Nietzsche says instead of nihilism, let's talk about a transvaluation of values. Not a negation of all value, but a transvaluation. So like it's a, a constant revaluation, I guess, you know, or standing over values and valuing the values or whatever, right? But it's certainly not like a, just like a casting them off and then going, whatever, 